want to share with you one of my favorite stories in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament. And whilst it's in the Old Covenant, it is a display of the New Covenant. We have the prophet Elijah, who is just such a wonderful prophet. He's so strong. He has so much ability, so much strength. He calls fire down from heaven and consumes a sacrifice that has been just uh, doused with water. A phenomenal prophet. And yet at the end of his life, which he chose to give up because he knew he couldn't accomplish the mission. At the end of his life, he says, this is too much for me. I can't make it. And it is the perfect picture of the law. Because the law is designed to show you, you can't make it, even if you can call fire down. Now, hands up confidently for those of us who have called fire down. Good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Then I can offend you this morning and I'll be fine. Not many people call fire down. Not many people at all. Elijah was one of those. And yet he said, I can't make it. I'm no better than my father's. Fire breathing dragon <laughs> couldn't make it. And so on pops the scene, Elisha. And Elisha is a beautiful picture of the new covenant. Because he said to Elijah, hey man, I need double what you have. I know it's not possible to make it with what you're living in. I'm going to need more. And if you count up the miracles that Elijah performed, I believe, this is years ago that I counted this, but I believe it was 32 miracles. Uh, sorry, 16 miracles. Elisha performed 31 miracles. And then whilst his bones were in the grave, a fresh body was thrown in and was raised to life. And he performed his 32nd miracle, which was a miracle of going from death to life. As a dead man, he raised the dead to life. Isn't that a little, like there's another guy I know in the Bible. His name begins with a J. Jesus. <laughs> As a dead man on the cross, he raised the dead to life. We are walking, talking miracles of a dead man who in his weakest, most dead place, he performed the greatest miracle. Now, I don't know about you, but that goes against any logic that I could come up with. If I was going to design a Jesus, design a God who was going to come to earth, I would design big guy, big muscles, abs like the Marvel characters. He would be the guy that I thought I want to put my faith in him. And yet he was beaten and bruised and bloody and breathed his last. And in that breath, he performed the greatest miracle. He even took someone like me and made someone like me alive. And so I love the story of Elijah passing the baton to Elisha. Even the way that that progression happened is very comical and interesting. <laughs> Elijah's going, well, if you see me, then you can have it. And he trick, he's trying to trick Elisha at every corner. You can't have this. You can't have this. Everything of the old covenant is designed to keep you out of the new covenant. I love, I love those little shenanigans that plays, plays out. But very early on in Elisha's ministry, as a New Covenant-esque type, he's in the Old Covenant, but he's a picture of the New Covenant. He really is a prophet. Go figure. Uh, <laughs> pointing to the New Covenant. And in 2 Kings chapter 5, the most phenomenal story plays out. And I want to read that for you this morning. I was going to quote it, but I just think there's too much humor and too much gold in this story to just gloss over it cheaply. So we're going to go into the scripture this morning, at, at least 17 verses. You guys okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. If you're looking for a story to read this week, 2 Kings verse 5. All the verses in chapter 5. <laughs> Thank you. It was a test. It was a test. So remember, there's a kingdom of Israel. And they have enemies, the Aramites, the people from Aram, and um, they're not friends. They don't get on good terms. They're subservient to each other. They're beating each other up. The context is these people from Aram are the enemy, much like you and God <laughs> before you were saved. Yeah. And so on pops the scene, this guy called Naaman. Now, Naaman, by the way, he's not mentioned anywhere else. He's not a character outside of this chapter. <laughs> Very little mentioned about him. So this is... Important enough that whoever wrote these verses down thought we've got to include that in the scriptures because this shows us something about the character of God. 
Now Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram, the enemies of Israel. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. That's a little bit weird. This is an enemy of the Israelites. And the Lord had given him victory. Please do not read anything in local times and local geography into this. I'm talking biblically, okay? This is not political. This is spiritual. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. He looked good on the outside in his glistening, shining armor and all the medals on his breastplate. But underneath all of that, there was a problem. He had leprosy. And when you look at the big celebrities that you may semi-worship, and uh, you look at all the big characters and all your heroes and history books, never forget that what they're presenting to you isn't always the reality. I wonder what was more real to Naaman. The breastplate on the outside that he could not feel, that he only encountered every time his big sword cluttered into it, or the leprosy he could feel at every single moment. What was more real? When people came down to Naaman and bowed down and said, you are a great, great warrior. They're going to write history books around you, about you. They're going to read about you in Hong Kong in thousands of years' time. I wonder whether he smiled at that or whether he thought, but you don't know what the real truth is. Never, never measure people from the outside. God doesn't measure people from the outside. There's truths upon truths and layers of depths of information. And so at the same time, when you're looking at someone who looks like they've got it all together, remember, you shouldn't judge yourself too harshly. Right. Yeah, maybe they've got a breastplate, but maybe they've got leprosy underneath. Thank God for the... No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> understand, everyone's got their journey. Everyone's got their stuff they've got to deal with. Don't measure yourself second just because someone's on a TV or an Instagram post or a podium or a pulpit. You don't know what's going on. You gotta, you got, you got to get that. Some people are gonna miss that little detail, and they'll still always see themselves second. You are not second. God loves you. You're highly favored. What also that it releases you to celebrate other people's victories, because you're not going. I wish I was as good as them. You can go well, celebrate the victory, because they've also got stuff they got to deal with. Why don't we just celebrate the good things in their life? Don't get insecure and jealous. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from a of Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. So a little Israelite girl is working for the big strong enemy of Israel. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, this is in Israel, he would cure him of his leprosy. Can you see the love of this little servant girl, the least, serving the greatest? Little picture of Jesus here. The enemy being served. You know, when Jesus gave the prophecy of the guy who was beaten up in the street and the teacher of the law and the Pharisee walked past him, but who was it that came and rescued him to heal him up but a Samaritan? Naaman went to his master, his, the king, and, said, and told him what the little girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. All the stars are aligning. This guy is going to get his miracle. He's on the way. And he's got his strength and he's got his valiancy and he's got his commandership and he's got the king behind him with a whole letter, a whole Instagram post. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. Lots of goods, lots of treasure. He's now going to pay for his miracle. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter, I'm sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. All wonderful so far? Yeah. As soon as the king of Israel, I want you to read this as if you're the king of Israel. You get a letter from an enemy king, troublesome guy, who says, I want you to cure my commander of leprosy. <laughs> Sounds like a little bit of a challenge, right? There's not a favor. It sounds like you've got to do the impossible. How many of you have been asked to cure someone of leprosy? <laughs> Just put yourself in that seat. I don't want to touch him. He's got leprosy. Maybe I'll get something. <laughs> anyway. Uh, 
as soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. This is a political strategy. He's going to entrap me to show that I am exposed. I'm, I can't do this. So he exposes himself. He tears his robes and says, I'm not God. I can't do this. It's incredibly funny. Some might even say humble, but this guy wasn't a humble man. When Elisha, the prophet, this picture of the new covenant, heard when the, uh, Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. Can you see the king of Israel's perspective was limited by his own kingship? Now, you may forgive him for that because he's the king. He's the top God. But the prophet knew there was an authority from heaven that was greater than the authority of man. So the prophet from heaven, God's authority says, bring him to me. I'm being so naughty in my mind because I got stories from other churches where the pastors thought that they were the be all and end all and if they couldn't solve the problem they couldn't see a solution because they thought they were it let me tell you your pastor is not your solution and I'm not saying that to get the responsibility off my shoulders I prepare and I pray and I pray for people in city church and I pray for the destiny of city church but I, I want to tell you that as your pastor, I've not taken the responsibility on as being the be-all and end-all for City Church. I cannot. I can't pick up the responsibility that is Jesus' responsibility alone. He said, I will build my church. And when it comes to your own life, CCI Christian, do not think you are the master of your own destiny. You've got to understand that there is a king who has authority that you will never have. And you've got to submit to that authority and go, Lord, I'm sending this problem to you because I don't know how to deal with it. Don't go and do what the king of Israel did and tear your robes and beat yourself up and say, woe is me. I don't know what to do because you're trapped by the vision of yourself. You're not the captain of your ship. When you died, you belonged to another. You're on someone else's ship, CCI Christian. So when the problem comes, the Bible says, cast your cares upon him. You don't cast your cares upon someone else out of an irresponsibility. You cast your cares to the person who is authorized to deal with those problems. So Elisha says, send him to me. Jesus says, send your problems to me. So just agree and go, I don't know how to deal with this, but I'm not going to tear on my robes. I'm going to send my problem to Jesus. So not very many amens. Obviously, you guys have got no problems. <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> I got problems. I got problems. And I know there's pe people in city church that got problems. And when I get a little too self-consumed and self-involved, thinking that I've got to come up with a solution, I get very depressed. I get very sad. I get very grumpy, ask Bonnie, I'm grumpy nine times out of, nine days out of the week, and, <laughs> and it's because I'm building a pressure on myself about things that I was never authorized to solve. So I've got to learn in humility, don't beat yourself up and tear up your robes, cast your cares, send it to Jesus. If that's the only thing you take from today, then just praise Jesus and say, amen, amen, I'm going to cast my cares. So the king of Israel has been consumed by himself, limited by himself. But the prophetic comes in and says, hey, there's another way. Send him to me. Not an arrogance. Not a look at what I can do. Just an understanding of the authorization. There was another commander. Another foreign commander when Jesus was around that came to him and said, I'm a man under authority. You don't have to come to my house, Jesus. For I, when I send a man, he goes, and when I call a man, he comes. So you just say the word, and my servant or my daughter, whatever it is, will be healed. And Jesus commanded him as someone with great faith. 
I wonder if Jesus had this story in his mind. He did have this story in his mind when he said to the Jews, hey, in those times of famine, there were only two people who got healed. They were both foreigners. This is one of the foreigners that got healed. So Elisha says, send him to me. I'm not restricted by your earthly authority. I have a heavenly authority that governs. So he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and his chariots and his entourage and his treasures and his long conveyor belt of limousines and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Isn't Elisha blessed to have this celebrity come to his home? And what does Elisha do? He gets out of his house and he grovels and gets on his knees. I'm so blessed for you to come here. Please, can I take a selfie? Can I get an autograph? No. Elisha, remember, the guy's just outside his house. The guy he invited to his house. Elisha sent a messenger to him. <laughs> Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan. Then your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. Elisha knew which way around the blessing was flowing. He didn't need an autograph. He didn't need a payment. He didn't need a celebrity Instagram post to make it look like who he's hanging out with. He just knew this guy's going to get blessed. God is doing something here. I don't need the glory. You see people on Instagram all the time picturing themselves with famous celebrities or pastors, international speakers. And I just, I cringe. I think, oh, why are you doing that? Why, why do you need to do that? Good people. Bill Johnson. Not Bill Johnson. Other people coming to Bill Johnson like he's a celebrity. He ain't a celebrity. He's a Christian just like you and me. I wonder, <laughs> I'm not trying to be controversial. I'm not trying to be horrible. I'm not trying to put anyone down. I'm just trying to say, put your faith in Jesus, not a man. And I'm not against selfies, and I'm not even against selfies with Bill Johnson. Go and do it. Fine. Just understand where your faith lies. Not in men, in Jesus. And those men are gracious enough to allow people to take selfies. But grow up. You don't need that. Understand where your faith is. Okay. Okay, sure. I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to be an old grumpy man. Although I am an old grumpy man, so you can discount what I'm saying there. Just disregard it. But when you're truly secure, and you truly are walking in favor with Jesus, side by side with Jesus, what selfie do you need? Selfie with Jesus. So it's just you by yourself, me and Jesus. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Okay, I'm not sure. I, I can hear old grumpy men in my head giving me a pat on the back. I'm saying, I don't want to be an old grumpy man. Just understand where your faith lies. Okay, so Elisha sends a servant to the foreigner after he called him to himself. Now, for me, when I look at this, I'm looking at a picture of grace. Grace said, I can solve your problem. Don't be restricted by man. Come to my house. When the foreigner, you and I, come to the house of grace we do not get grace <gasps> we get the servant we get the law because you think you coming to the house earns and deserves your salvation your miracle your healing because i arrived so it's dangerous a lot of faith teaching talks about positioning yourself and i agree with a lot of that but sometimes it's interpreted that if i position myself correctly then i deserve the miracle your position does not deserve the miracle you can't add anything to your miracle can anyone heal someone of leprosy by natural means so I don't care if you're praying to the east, to the west, to the north, the south, upside down. I don't care if you pray 16 scriptures or two scriptures. You've got your 10, Acts 10, 38. You've got your pictures on your, your fridge. I don't care what you've done. I don't care if you fasted for 48 days because you're better than Jesus and you've got the River Jordan water you splash on your head with anointing oil from the Pope. I don't care what you've done. None of that stuff earns and deserves your miracle. Nothing. No matter how much good works you do can get you closer to God. You can have 16 uh, limousines outside of the house. You don't get grace. You do not earn and deserve it. And so what does Elisha do? Grace, the, the prophetic picture of grace, he doesn't attend. He sends the servant of the law. And the law-based servant says, now you've got to do something to earn it. Can you see that imagery? Look at the response. This is why Elisha was correct in what he did. 
He said, uh, you're going to be clean. Just go and dip yourself seven times in the river Jordan. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord and wave his magic handbag over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. He had a mindset. He had a philosophy. He had a framework that expected something in a certain way. And he wanted a big ceremony that he could do a show and tell about. Because look at my entourage. Look at how far I've come. Look at what I've done to earn and deserve. And Elisha didn't fall for the trap. Grace will not be conned by how much you do. Are not a banner and... I don't know how to say these words, Fapa or Pahapa, the rivers of Damascus, better than these waters of Israel. This dirty old rubbish little stream thing. It was dried up just a few little, little while ago. Well, Elisha was getting fed from ravens and this way. It dried up. This is not a great river. I've got better water at home. I can make a bigger song and dance about this, about my miracle. I can do it in a better way. Better than these waters of Israel. Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? Can't I have it my way? Can't I earn and deserve the way that I think it should be? Shouldn't God be limited to my philosophy? So he turned and went off in a rage. Little like Cain. Naaman's servant, the little girl, went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? Naaman, go and kill the dragons on the mountaintops. Naaman, go and build a city in my honor. Naaman, go and conquer these armies. Prove your strength. Would you not have done that? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? Why not do this little thing in this dirty old river? You want to prove your strength, Naaman. But that's not what God required from you. He didn't require your strength. Can't I run? Can't I try? Can't I do? Can't I attend? Can't I tithe? Can't I pray? Can't I fast? No, nope, I don't need your strength. Your strength was never part of the equation. So the little girl, the little girl, the least, says, hey, do this little thing. Wash and be cleansed. So he went down. We're reading into the story here, but he had to take off his armor. He had to take off his strength. He had to, in humility, strip himself. He had to strip himself. He had to strip himself of all his good works, all his accolades, all his medals, all of his ability. Can you imagine how humbling that is for a commander? This is the top guy in the military world in that arena. Aram is only as good it is as it is because of this guy. And now he's having to take off what's earned him his credibility, what earned him that letter, what earned him the right to go and even visit Israel with a letter from the king. And as he takes it off, amen, I, I absolutely, absolutely. The Bible says that God gives grace to the humble, but Lord to the proud. He had to humble himself. He had to get rid of his ability. Exactly right, Todd. Exactly right. And so he had to humble himself in Israel, in the enemy of his own country. Not in a pompous ceremony with all of the trumpets playing. It was a defeat that he had to offer, not a victory. And as he takes it off and he dips in seven times, guess what happens? He gets healed. So he went down, dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, the man of God had told him to do, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and his attendants went back to the man of God, stood before him. Now look at who he's talking to now. He's not talking to the law anymore, not talking to the servant. Now he's talking to the picture of grace. He went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept my gift from your servant. Look, he's still got a philosophy that says I need to give. Notice this. This is the preach for today. He's still got a philosophy that says I need to give in order to maintain my miracle. 
I still need to do something to add to salvation in order to keep it secure. Sound like any Christianity you've been around? Look at what grace says. So please accept, for, uh, accept this gift from the servant. The prophet answered, as surely as the Lord lives. Isn't that a funny statement? As surely as he exists. There is no existence without God existing. He says, as surely as there is existence, I will not accept a thing. No matter what you have to offer, God will not accept a thing. There reason, there's a reason why he won't accept a thing. Because the second you add to salvation, you make salvation null and void. You dilute it to the point where it just breaks down. The quickest way to break a car is to not put pure petrol in. It's to add a little bit of sugar. You put a little bit of sugar in that engine, it breaks the whole thing. Just a little teaspoon will break the whole engine. Do you know that? The second you add a little bit of your good works to salvation, it no longer is salvation. We're going to read that in a second. So when you think that somehow you can add to salvation, add to the miraculous, add to God's grace, you are diluting everything. And so grace in this story says, I will not accept a thing. Here's a picture of new covenant grace. Don't mess it up. And so whilst Naaman still has an idea that he needs to earn and deserve, grace says you cannot give. Can I, can I say this? Each of us are in that place. Everyone, I believe everyone in this room is saved. You've had a confession of faith. You've believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth. You are now in Christ. But many of us are still in the place like Naaman is right here, where we think we need to add to what God has already done by offering him something. Grace will never accept your gift because grace is the greatest gift that you need to accept. And if you try and add to it, you're going to dilute it. Not, you can't dilute it truly. You can just dilute it in your life. So this is what most Christians struggle with. Most Christians are not struggling with sin and pornography and addictions and anger and not doing their, that's not the, that's not the problem. That's fruit. The problem is you haven't seen grace being offered to you. And so you're trying to pay for that grace and you limit and dilute it through your own world. So why, we, why do we keep on preaching about grace, 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 grace? Because grace is the foundation that sustains anything spiritual in your life. That's the only thing that provides power in your life is grace and receiving it by faith. There is no faith without grace because what are you relying on? What are you believing in? That's the only thing that should be preached from a pulpit is God's grace. Anything outside of God's grace is now man's effort and it's foolishness and it'll lead you into all sorts of problems. And then we preach more life principles to try and manage the problems. Well, if you just preached foundation, get your root system right, know how to access God by faith because of his grace aimed towards you, then all of this other stuff will be washed away over time. We got a little river outside our house. It's a little trickle most of the time. When the rains start, because in Hong Kong, as we all know, we get monsoon rains, this thing becomes a torrent. If you jumped into it, you would die. It would just smash you against rocks and bridges and things. But when it first starts raining, that water is filthy. It's smelly. It's dirty. You can see it's just brown. But as the rains keep on going, three days in, four days in, it starts to become crystal clear. It becomes beautiful. Amen. Most people, Christians come into a place where they start to get the washing of the water of his word and there becomes all this brown stuff and they go oh it's so stinky oh, it's so stinky you gotta try harder and so they build filtration systems down river and they build little little uh, uh, side rivers to try and clean it all up and they've got all these management systems and they try and cover it all over because they don't want to see other people to see all their mess you know what if you just rested in God's grace and gave it three or four days we'll just wash you clean but we're working so hard that we miss the grace of God because we're trying to impress others. We're trying to cover over. We're trying to play religious games. There's a reason Naaman had to take his clothes off, take his, his exterior strength off before he could get healed. He had to see it's not about what you do. It's about what God's already done for you. Amen. 
great. We'll leave that there. So, God's nature is independent of your opinion of him. God's nature is just God's nature. It's who he is. So we have a word in Christianity uh, and any religion called theology. Theology is the study of the nature of God, of who he is, what he's about. That's what theology means. It's that simple, not too complicated. You don't need a dog collar. You don't need a degree to be into theology because if you love God, you're into the nature of God. So you're a theologian. Everyone turn to your neighbor and say, welcome to church, theologian. <laughs> philosophy is different philosophy is the love of wisdom it's the love of wisdom and so you may be tempted very cheaply and naively and we'll forgive you for this to go well i'm not philosophical i'm only theological let me say this nobody is perfectly theological not one person has ever been perfectly theological because no one has seen the perfection of who god is in, in his entirety we all have a limited view, we have a limited philosophy of theology. So all theology is filtered through the framework of your philosophy. Much like a little toilet roll. Get a little kid to look at the toilet roll. There's a beautiful big picture of God's nature. Your philosophy can only look at little bits of it. Now you may have a good philosophy or a bad philosophy, it's still limited. The, God's nature is limited through the framework of your philosophy. I want to give you a little example. In Matthew 5, 48, Jesus says, be perfect even as your heavenly father is perfect. If you've got a philosophy that says, I need to earn and deserve from God's good nature, then when you read that scripture, you read into that scripture your philosophy that says, I've got to try really hard. I've got to be perfect. Oh no, I sinned today because I was slightly angry with my wife. Oh, I got 99% on my math test. Oh, I didn't give a full 10%. It was 9.5%. And now God's going to, now I'm stealing from God and he's going to judge me. And so when you read that scripture, it reinforces your philosophy that you've got to try really hard to add to your salvation. And you've got all the scriptures that you can find in your philosophical framework to reinforce something that you're calling theology, but is actually philosophy. Let's take someone else. They look at that scripture and with accuracy and truth go, I could never be perfect as my heavenly father is perfect. So I'm not going to try at all. This is a bunch of baloney. Christianity is useless. I don't believe it at all. Their philosophical framework has just canceled out theology and said there is no theology because they know their philosophy is true that they can't be perfect as God is perfect. So they just ditched the whole thing. That's philosophy. That's a limitation of philosophy. And yet again, there's a third category of people, which I hope we are all of in this room, that says God is good. He is perfect. Wonderful truth. That's a theological truth. And I cannot be perfect in my own strength. Actually, the harder I try, the worse I get. Romans 7. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's reality. That's truth. So what I need to do is reconcile those two truths by receiving God's perfection as a free gift. I cannot be good in my own ability, but I can receive his goodness. So now I am perfect as he is perfect because I have his perfection. The same theological truth, three different philosophies. So don't get super spiritual and say, well, I don't have a philosophy. I only have theology. No, you have a philosophical, philosophical framework that filters theology through that. Now, if your philosophy is set up in such a way that it limits God's goodness, you need to change your philosophy. You need to repent. You, it's not that, repentance is not just confession of sins. It is the changing of your mind. It's the changing of the way that you think. Let me give you an example. I love Jeremiah 5.12. At 12 5. If you can't run with the men, the army, how can you run with the horses? If you can't run in the safe country, how are you going to run in the thicket of Jordan? If you can't do the easy thing, how are you going to do the hard thing? Essentially, is what that verse says. My whole life, I was taught, and the way that I read it, my philosophy with that deep theological truth was try harder. 
And the second you want to complain and say this is too difficult, remember Jeremiah 12, 5 that says, if you can't do this, how are you going to do the hard thing? So try harder. Everyone, anyone ever heard that before? Pictures of thumbnails with horses and a man ri- running and all the allegories of men outpacing horses in certain battles. And, you know, God's goodness is that you can outrun the horses. You've got to try harder. Beautiful testimonies around that. Really good, true testimonies. Well, I'd believe that. And so when I would get into a difficult space, what would I do? But quote Jeremiah 12, 5 to myself. I'm going to run with the horses. Thank you, Father, that I can run with the horses. Even though this is difficult and I feel like I'm dying, I'm going to do something even harder. So I'm studying this scripture a few years ago. Forgive me if you've heard the story before. And I'm studying about working harder and working under God's grace. And I've got all the terminology and all the things. And I'm feeling empty. And I'm feeling desperate. And I'm feeling t- tired. Tired. But I, if I can't do this, how can I, how can I run? Not run oh, and I keep on trying harder, 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 harder. And eventually one night, 2 a.m., I wake up and I feel a heavy presence. I want to say the word dark, but I know that has negative connotation spiritually. But it's a heavy presence. And it's such a heavy presence that I, I'm just not used to this presence. And my mind says, someone's breaking into your house. So I get up out of bed and I go and check all the doors. And I'm looking out the window, I've got a torch and I'm shining. Because so real was this presence to me, I thought, thought something negative was, happened, was happening. But at the same time, spiritually, I knew nothing negative was happening. It was just different. It was unusual for me. So I, I, I go... And pray and say, God, what's going on? He says, I want you to go. He doesn't even answer what's the exact situation. He says, go and read Jeremiah 12. I said, but God, you know Jeremiah 12 and you know that I know Jeremiah 12. Why do you want me to read Jeremiah 12 to you? Now, remember, I'm nervous because I don't know what's going on. and I'm checking for burglars. So now me and God are having this weird conversation. And it's like he's forgotten Jeremiah 12 and now I need to remind him. I know God is the ancient of days, but he's got a good memory. Thank you for that laughter. Thank you for that applause. <laughs> so, I, so I open my Bible. I remember my eyes are, are like Chinese eyes. And I'm like, I can't, can't see this. So I open up the Bible. And I go to Jeremiah 12. I say, God, you know this. But I'm going to read it. I read me Jeremiah 12. If you can't run with the troops, how are you going to run with the See, God, I know this. He says, read the whole chapter. And it occurred to me, I wasn't really sure of the context. Remember, I've been taught this. And like you, I've been taught this my whole life. I know this verse. So I start to read the whole chapter. And I encourage you, go and read this yourself. The whole context is, Israel, you're so proud. Israel, you've got it all together. You've figured it all out, haven't you, Israel? And I'm about to destroy you. And you've got all these prophecies about how good things are going to be. But I'm about to decimate you. You're going to be taken into captivity. Israel, you're going to, be, you're going to cease to exist. That's the context. And so when you reread with the context, that verse, the verse says, you guys think you can run with the troops. You, I mean, you guys think you can run with the horses. You can't even run with the troops. You think you can run in the difficult country. You can't even run in the safe country. And it flipped it 180 degrees in my mind. And I realized I had been reading a theological truth with a philosophical framework that had twisted the word of God. And what was meant to be a scripture to humble me, I was reading as a scripture that empowered my self-deception of my own strength. Let me say that again. What was meant to be a scripture that was meant to humble me became in my philosophical framework, it became a scripture that empowered the deception that my running harder added to the cross, added to the kingdom, added to the church. And I trembled for 10 or 15 minutes, physically trembled, because that dark, heavy force, I realized what was going on. God was giving me a hiding, a loving, beautiful, disciplinary, bring me closer to him hiding, not a discipline that I'm going to beat you until you repent and then come back to me on your hands and knees. No, I was already on my hands and knees in my self-deception, and he was beating me out of my self-deception to come into a humility 
and I felt that closeness to him. I physically trembled. I know great grace Christians don't like the fear of God. They want to turn it into something soft. The, the fear of God is the fear of God. It's fall down on your face as if dead fear of God. Because when you realize how terribly strong he is, terrible in the most pure sense of the word, how incredible, awesome he is, what other response is there but tremble and fall down on your knees? Now, he's a loving God, but he's a powerful God. And when I saw that, my philosophy had to upgrade, and I had to repent of a limiting philosophy to see God's goodness and to see that my, adding, my, my attempt to add to his finished work was only hurting myself. And it hurt people around me. Your philosophy will limit theology. Not, God's, not who God is, just in your life. It will limit his flow of goodness. And so your philosophy needs to repent and adapt and submit to true biblical theology. That's why preaching is so important. I heard this wonderful, uh, does anyone know of the preacher called Martin Lloyd-Jones, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones? I highly recommend get any book of his, anything he's ever done, Let's download his preachers, um, most of them are written form, but just the most, most wonderful man of God who really preached the heart of God, wonderful. A lot of good preachers out there. And he said when he started, he finished um, Bible college or seminary, whatever it is, and he got a list of churches he could have chosen to become the pastor at. And he chose the smallest, dingiest, darkest, middle of nowhere church, I think in Wales. And he said, the reason I chose that church is because if I can preach here and the gospel works, then the gospel will work anyway. So he, <laughs> he chose the most difficult place. And when he arrived, he said, when I arrived at the church, this, this was a small dwindling church, no, not much real power, not much revelation of the gospel but there's a lot of frivolity a lot of surface level actions one of the things they would do is on a saturday night they would have a drama presentation to the people in the little village and they would move the pulpit out the way and they would do their little drama play to get people saved and they would do their song and dances and people loved it and enjoyed it but it wasn't very powerful he said the first thing he did when he arrived at that little old church is he took the pulpit he put it in the middle of the stage and he bolted it down <laughs> so they couldn't move it out of the way. He said, the preaching of the gospel is central. And that church exploded and grew and there was power demonstrated because he knew that if you allow people, each of us, to have our philosophies, even though we may have some theological ideas, they will be limited in the view of God. Philosophy needs to change and submit to biblical theology. So you need to listen to good preaching. And I'm the first person to say, preaching is not the, the be all and end all. You've got to have a relationship with God. But sometimes your relationship with God is limited by bad philosophy. So preaching comes in to demolish mindsets and strongholds, tear them down so you can see the bigness of who God is. Sometimes you need a heavy presence in your midst to actually make you repentant of bad philosophy. Christians are so worried about sin, 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 sin. I'm telling you, sin is not that big a problem. It was dealt with at the cross by one man, one time, once for all. Sin is no longer a problem. But philosophy that's limiting the good of goodness of God, that's scary. And that's not preached often because we're so worried about sin. If you get philosophy right, sin will follow. Don't try and amend your, the changing of sin will follow. Don't try and amend sinful patterns in your life. Until you've got a good view of who God is. Naaman can scrub himself all day long. Recognizing the pattern of sin and problem and leprosy. All day long. Until he gets his philosophy right. Of the true theology of who God is. That's when he gets healed. When he lets go of his own ability and his own strength. And humbles himself. He comes into a place of healing. Even though he had tried, I'm sure, all the miracle cures, all the snake oil salesmen, all the crypto scams, all the MLL, MLM marketing schemes. It's only when he came to a place of humility and looked at who God is and that he couldn't rely on himself was change occurring. You've got to bolt the pulpit of your own heart down and put that as center. You've got to say, okay, I'm going to believe God's word and let my ideas submit to who God is. Right. 
So that's what we do. That's what we do on Sunday mornings. We're changing philosophy. We're changing mindsets. We're repenting. We may not be, may not be on our knees repenting, but we are repenting. Somebody say, Amen. Okay. The consequences of theology or the implications of theology must make it through your, theology, uh, your philosophical framework. They must make it through in order for them to have an effect in your life. If you just have theology, but your philosophy doesn't upgrade to encompass that, then it's like the little kid with a toilet roll holder. You just miss the grace of God. You miss what really is saying. And you can nod your head all day long. You can be in church services six times a week. It'll make no difference until actually the reality of the theology confronts your philosophy and you make a change. You've heard this joke before, but just because you live in a garage, it doesn't make you a car. You need to be confronted with God's truth. There needs to be a revelation in order for that change to happen, for you to encompass a greater degree of God's goodness. If it isn't, you're just going to be nodding, 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 nodding. So I'm very careful when I talk to people, even if they believe something completely different, atheists, Muslims, even Christians, I will talk to them. It was a joke. And uh, I will talk to them. And it's not about me trying to change them. It's me trying to understand what are they saying? What's their philosophy? So people can talk to me about the most boring thing. And my mind the whole time is going, why do you believe that? Where did that come from? What were your parents like? Why do you come to this point of view? And they're talking about something that I really don't care about. Because I'm trying to understand what is the philosophy. And especially with Christians who are talking about salvation or sin or the Holy Spirit. I'm not really listening to what they're saying at the surface. I'm listening to what they're saying behind that. If someone says, you know, God loves you, but my ears prick up. I think, okay, we, we're about to hear philosophy now. We're about to hear a filtered version of theology. What are you really saying? What are you about to say? Because I can guarantee you most Christians across the world, but including in Hong Kong, most Christians will say, God loves you, but you need to do X, do Y, do Z. And if you don't, well, are you truly saved? Just me? I'm the only person who's encountered that? So then the question becomes, well, what's the fundamental here? What's the theology? Well, you know, God loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, God loves you. No, Jesus died on the cross for you, which is powerful imagery, by the way. I don't know if you've ever noticed Jesus on the cross should be something that makes you drop to your knees and go, oh, Jesus, you, the God of the universe, came to earth in human form, in flesh, and was sacri you allowed yourself to be sacrificed. If that's not a statement, there is no statement in the world. And then you look at that and you go, yes, the cross, but, and then profess whatever profanities and deceptions about salvation that you want to go into. And I've got to do X, Y, and Z, and I've got to be holy, and I've got to try really hard, and I've got to be perfect. What an insult to what Jesus did on that cross. There is no but after the cross. There's the cross. And then there's half an hour on the floor in tears, sobbing. That's what the cross is. It's much more than that. It's not, oh, the cross, but. There's no buts at the cross. It's just the cross, the cross, the cross, the cross. And you don't get the cross on day one of Christianity. The cross is once for all time. And if that's not your theology, you need to change. You need to change your philosophy. You need to repent and go, it's the cross. Everything before the cross looked to the cross. Everything from the cross looks back to the cross. It is the center of the universe for a reason. And there's too many Christians going around going, the cross but, the cross but, the cross but. There is no the cross but. You haven't seen Jesus if you're going the cross but. Jesus loves you but. That is demonic. I'm not saying those people have demons, and I'm not saying they love the demon. I'm just saying, get your theology right. Let your philosophy adapt and change and submit to theology, which is the cross. Somebody say amen. amen. If you don't say amen, I'm going to get louder. <laughs> the reason I'm so violent about that is about what, what I'm about to say to you. 
Because what I'm about to say to you, Paul is screaming. He is shouting from the rooftops. Because there were people who were saying, the cross but, what about this? We have to add that to the cross. And what about this thing? And circumcision is a big thing in the Bible. Baptism is a big thing today. Tithing is a big thing. And I'm thinking, well, I thought the cross was the big thing. Are we preaching more about tithing in the church than the cross? Because that's demonic. Let me say that again. Are we preaching more about tithing than the cross? That's demonic. If you're preaching more about all the good actions that you can do and Christians presenting a good version of who God is, more than the cross, that's demonic. I'm not saying doing good things and tithing are demonic. You're not, you, you, you're not hearing what I'm saying. I'm saying there's an emphasis on the cross because everything else flows from the cross. And I'm all for helping little old ladies across the street. I'm all for tithing. I'm all for the good. I'm all for church attendance. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't for church attendance. So th those things are all good. But man, if you want to look at the cross as the same size as all of those things, you're wrong. You're just wrong. Uh, change your philosophy. Change. Just repent and go, Jesus, what you did on the cross is what we're going to bow down in eternity. For all of time, we will bow down at that cross, at the one who sacrificed himself on the cross. All those other things have their place. But I'm telling you, the second thing on the list is far, 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 far down the list compared to what Jesus did. Okay. <laughs> oh, shame. Okay, Paul is talking about the cross here in the scripture we're going to bring up, 1 Corinthians 1. And the context here is humans, men, Christians, are talking about who's the greatest and whose name they got baptized into. It's funny that Naaman was baptized, and here in 1 Corinthians runs, we're also talking about baptism. Oh, I was baptized by Paul. Oh, no, I listened to Apollos' words. Oh, no, I'm, I'm so great because I was under so-and-so's teaching. Love so-and-so's teaching. You know, I love Rob Rufus. I love his teaching. I, I, those 2007, 8, 9, 10 messages, I'm telling you, there's no better messages on the planet. But I'm a Jesus disciple, not a Ruf, Rob Rufus disciple. Can you see that? And I have no problem saying I learned grace from Rob Rufus. No pro I, love, I love that. But never make the mistake that you're anyone's disciple. You are not anyone's disciple except for Jesus'. Can you, see, can you see my love for Rob Rufus? But my love for Jesus. You should have the same thing. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. He's not saying follow him. He's saying as much as he follows Christ, follow him, which means follows Christ. That's who you're a disciple of. And so here he's, he's encountering bickering from people who should be adults but are acting like children. They're acting worldly about who baptized them and who preached to them and who's the greatest. And he's saying, guys, come on, grow up. It's Jesus. You're getting into all sorts of issues here that are not the main issue. Let's follow Jesus here. Let's watch what he says. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. The more you play the surface level Instagram game, the more you empty the cross of its power because you're putting emphasis on your ability, not on God's ability. When you look at the cross, you're looking at God's ability. He said, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Now, is he being heretical? He's saying the cross is foolish. I was saying to those people who are looking at the cross with this worldly mindset, it looks like a foolish thing. Why do you need a cross? I'm under Paul. I'm under Apollos. I'm under this guy who did this amazing thing. Get the cross out of the way. Let's talk about who our hero is. That's what he's saying. But to us who are being saved, it is the power. Of God. Let me read that again. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Can you see outside of the cross, there is no power of God applied to us. The cross is the power of God. Now let's go to Romans 1. Romans 1 says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Talking about the gospel of the cross of Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. You want God's power? Go to the cross. Go to the gospel. 
because uh, the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First of the Jew, then of the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith. Not by what man is able to do. This guy or that guy. This celebrity or that preacher. It's by faith. Which is believing that what was done on the cross, foolish though it may seem, was God's power being delivered to us. For a righteousness from God is revealed that is by faith from first to last. Just as it's written, the righteous will live by faith. And that's not faith just aimed aimlessly. No, ma no matter where you choose faith to be, I've got to have faith. Or I have faith in myself, faith in this, faith in the church. No, it's faith in what was done at the cross. So 1 Corinthians 1 it says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligence, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Now, when you think about this, if you were going to design salvation, think of Naaman, what would you design? You would design a big, strong man who could chop people's heads off, and destroy the enemy and kill Satan and win the battle for you. In our earthly mindset, that's what we gravitate towards. We gravitate towards the world champions. Yeah? Who are the kids? I mean, who are the kids putting up on their walls at home? It's not the losers. It's the, it's the heroes. It's the winner. Sammy's, Sammy, Sammy, I can't even remember his name. Sammy now has just got the concept of winning and losing. So now we're eating and he's going, Baba, I win you. I win you. I'm like, no, you're a whaley. Please, please don't beat me at eating because you'll be so fat. <laughs> but he doesn't gra gravitate towards losing. There's nothing in him that likes to lose. He wants to win. And it's the same for all of us. We want to win. And who wins but the big, strong guy? If you think about the Greeks, all their statues are big, muscly guys with abs. And, you know, I would have been one of those statues for sure. Uh, <laughs> and they're flexing and they go. And the whole Olympic Games from the, came from the Greeks. And it was all about who's the best of the best of the best of the best. Win that crown. When we're designing a savior in our own minds, our own philosophy, we want the big, strong guy. And so when you look at the cross, it looks like foolishness. Because what is the cross but loss? What is the cross? but death. The cross is not the picture of a champion. The cross is a picture of the biggest loser in history. In all of history, no one was a bigger loser because the king of heaven who had everything, he had all the glory, volunteered of his own free will to come to earth to give it all away. You think the gold and frankincense and the myrrh was anything like the gifts that he had in heaven where elders are bowing down and giving their, th their crowns, where there's a majesty and angels upon myriads of angels just encircling around him, doing their harsh, and, <laughs> and just bowing down before him. You think any of that glory compared to the glory that he had in an old barn, little manger? No. And he gave all of that up and then even gave up his last breath. Well... That's stupid. That's a loss. That's a loser. But that was by design. God designed that the one who had the most gave up the most. So that those who had just a little bit could die along with him and receive the highest accolades in heaven along with him. So my brothers, we died so we could belong to another. Where is the philosopher? Where is the white person? Where is the teacher of the law? Notice the philosopher or the wise person is the Greek, the Gentile, the clever dude, the Socrates and Plato. And where is he? Where's the teacher of the law? The Pharisee, the guy who knows all the Torah. Got a flat head because he keeps on wailing at the... Where is the philosopher of this age? See, your philosophy has an has a influence on you. It is the filter of influence. Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, 
the world through its wisdom did not know him. No matter how clever you were as a Greek, you could sit there in your cave contemplating the meaning of life. You could push boulders up a hill. You could think about living uh, um, austere lives and giving away your things. You could become a monk. You could just um, um, become a hedonist and just enjoy all the pleasures. You could do any angle of the spectrum of different philosophies through all of that god made them look all stupid all of their intelligence years and decades and centuries of study and stoicism and different greek philosophies all of that god made stupid in one move for since the wisdom of god through the world uh, uh, in the wisdom of god the world through its wisdom did not know him god was pleased can you see him smiling maybe smoking god was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached about what preached about the cross through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who tithe i mean save those who attend church no no Sa save those who get baptized no 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 save those who don't sin oh no no no, no. save those who belief how stupid is that they didn't have to go to a mountaintop they didn't have to win a competition they didn't have to give away the most they didn't have to become the richest or the poorest in fact they didn't have to do anything god was pleased to save those who believe in the foolishness of the cross but don't I have to? Who are you sounding like when you say, but don't I have to do? Don't I have to give? Don't I have to experience this thing? You're not sounding like a foolish God. You're sounding like a wise man. And God was pleased that through what men call foolish, that he would make foolish the wisdom of men. Can you see that interplay? It's not clever to believe in the cross. It's not wise to believe in the cross. It's foolish. No wonder Christians are persecuted for faith. Faith is hated in the world because it's so stupid. It's so benign. It's so useless. You should never be surprised when a friend of yours says, you got faith? Ugh, what's that? It's just a petty excuse because you're not clever. You're right. I'm not clever. I'm stupid. I'm foolish. You're right but I believe. Now watch this. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demanded signs. Now, think about Jewish history. When they are being delivered out of Egypt, what is the sign that they're going to come out? By the way, it's an easy question. You've got 10 options. Uh, frogs and flies and rivers turning red and firstborn sons being killed and darkness. And then they get out of Egypt uh, to, the, to the Red Sea and that whole thing splits up. And then they've got pillars of fire and cloud and signs upon signs upon signs upon signs. What were Jews exposed to in those signs? They were exposed to a physical manifestation of the power of God. So Jews' philosophy shifted from a theology of God as a father to God as a powerful champion. So when they expected God to show up, they expected power. So when Jesus said, listen, boys, I'm it. They said, prove it, because we're used to power. We want power. Is that fair? It's not wrong to want the power of God. But if your philosophy can only see power, you're in trouble because you're going to miss 99 other elements of who God is. And so the Jews demanded signs. They demanded their earthly, menly power. And the Greeks looked for wisdom. They wanted something clever. They wanted what Jesus, what cave do you have to live in for all of these years to come to a place of enlightenment, come to karma, come to nirvana. That's what they're looking for. But Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews because it's not very powerful is it where the king of the universe is being defeated by some dirty bacon eating Gentiles you know what Jesus could have called down 12 legions he chose not to he wasn't going to demonstrate his power he was demonstrating 
weakness. And he wasn't weak. It took a lot of strength for him not to be powerful. <laughs> if that makes any sense. It took a lot of power to not just act in force. It takes a lot of power for God not to just smite itch every single one of us. In fact, it takes the most powerful thing in the universe. It takes grace to not just smite us all. So the cross is a stumbling block to the Jews and it is foolishness to the Gentiles. What has a cross got to do with salvation? But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Beautiful. Let me say that again. But to those whom God has called, the Jews and the Greeks, the cross or the Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Isn't that powerful? And isn't that wise what happened on that cross? For the foolishness of God is wiser than the human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Now, I want you to apply this greater than just the picture of Gol Golgotha. I want you to apply this to your own lives. What's more powerful in your life? Your philosophy of what you can add or the, or the philosophy of what he can add? What's more powerful? Your education or his education? What's more powerful? His ability to call fish into the net or your ability to work, money, work a job and earn money? What's more powerful? If you're honest which not many of us are, that was honest. <laughs> if you're honest in your daily life, you're more powerful. If you've ever felt stress, it's because you're picking up a burden that you haven't given to Jesus. And I'm not trying to make anyone feel condemned for stress. I feel stressed almost every day. But part of the journey of this short little brief experience that we have called life is learning to cast your cares. And how much better does it feel when you've casted your care and you've relied on him. The us usually we feel stressed because we don't want to let go of our responsibility to carry, to pick, to earn, to deserve. And so that stress comes because we can't do it. But we haven't given it to the one who can. And I'm preaching to myself because I'm a hyper-responsible oldest child. Ask my brother. He'll nod till his head falls off. I'm always picking up. I'm always trying to compensate. I'm always trying to carry. I'm always trying to make sure I carry the burden so others don't. And then the hardest thing for me to do, besides from my hair in the morning, is to let go of burdens. It's, it's incredible. But you know what? That's what faith is. It's letting go of the burden and letting Jesus pick it up. And I don't think I'll ever come to the end of that lesson. But my philosophy needs to submit to theology. And I need to adapt and go, okay, God, I'm going to let go. For the foolishness of God is wiser than the human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards, and not many were influential. Not many of you, of you were of noble birth. Hey, hey, I come from a good family. No, I'm joking. Uh, we were poor. We were poor. We didn't have food. Do you know my parents didn't have food for weeks on end? And then one day at church, yeah, Christians, but poor. <laughs> I think God told my mom, invite those people for lunch. She says, well, we don't have any food. She says, invite them for lunch. So she invites people to lunch. We've got no food. Now, I don't know about you, but that's irresponsible. That is stupid. That is foolish. Do you think that that's foolish? Come to my house for lunch, but you don't have lunch. Do you know what? Every single one of those people bought food. And so my parents ate and we ate as kids because they were obedient to something that's quite foolish. That's the power of the cross. Working through a philosophy that said, let go of your own human strength. And I believe at that very same meal, they had food multiplied because they didn't have enough food that was bought, but God multiplied it to all of them. Is that right? Stupid. It's foolish. That's often where the miraculous happens, is in the stupid. It's in the foolish. To see the miraculous, you've got to do, often do the ridiculous. And I don't like that as a rule, because it sounds like the miraculous only happens because you're stupid. But, but it's true. I don't like it, because I'm trying to be clever. I'm trying to present to you the best version of myself. I don't want to look like a fool. But sometimes it's just foolish 
The miraculous is just foolish. Who would have thunk it that Jesus, the King of Heaven, would come to a cross? That's foolish. Sorry, God. That's what Peter said. Sorry, God, you're not going to the cross. Far be it from us. I'm going to chop off ears before you go to the cross. What does Jesus say to him? Get behind me, Satan. He said, if, the, if those principalities and powers had known, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory because their whole mindset was locked up in. How big are we? How great are we? What was Lucifer thrown out of heaven for? But trying to get glory to himself. You probably saw God's grace and went, I didn't like this grace nonsense. The cross, but, you know, Jesus, but. Yeah, Adam and Eve, you know, God, yeah, God is good, but, uh, but he's holding out on you. He's not that good. You think the first Christian was the first but Christian? No, the devil was the first but Christian. And don't get locked up in your human standards, or your whole, whole philosophy. Sometimes the stupid, the foolish is where grace happens the most. I've told the story before. I only know grace because my brother knows grace. And he, he, he was listening to Joseph Prince, Pastor Prince, and it would irk me. It would irritate me. I'd get so angry because I didn't like grace. I thought if you got AIDS, you deserved AIDS. Because that was my philosophy. And here he's listening to greasy, disgusting grace. Pastor Prince, Pastor. And he's going on about grace and he's all happy and light and casting his cares. And I'm the older brother. And he was just so gracious, 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 gracious. Just, uh, just irritated me. I could use much harder language, but not on a pulpit. And one day... I've sold the story before, but I just think it's, it's, it's so foolish, and yes, it's so gracious. He comes home from university. Lazy bum has bought all his washing home. I didn't let my mother do my washing since I was 15 years old. I wouldn't let her do it. I would do my own washing. He goes to university as a 20-something, would bring all his, just store up all his washing, bring it home. <laughs> yeah, mom. <laughs> and here I am, the older brother, judging him, this fool. Comes home, brings his washing. My mom's in the process of doing all his washing for him. I don't know why she would do that. I would tell her not to. And my mom says, hey, Seamus, we're taking some old clothes to the clothes bin to donate it to the poor. Would you help me? So Seamus, Seamus himself says, of course, mom. Seamus himself picks up his own clothes in the, bla in the black plastic bags and carries his own clothes <laughs> at my mom's request to the clothes bin and dumps them in the bin himself not someone else himself and when i hear the story i am laughing and i'm grinning and i'm going how foolish is he because he threw his own clothes away <laughs> he's got the only clothes he's got are the clothes he's wearing he gave everything else away stupidly <laughs> what a fool am i right fool he mixed it up he mixed up what should have been washed with what should have been donated <laughs> so a lot of people got dirty clothes do you know by that same time the next day Seamus had more clothes and better clothes than he ever owned in his whole life because people heard about his foolishness and gave him grace and you know what I did I just had to shake my head and said there's something on him that's not on me there's a grace that he lives in that I don't live in because I'm bitter and I'm twisted and I'm angry and I hate grace preaching but there's some philosophy that he's living in because I have I'm also professing God but my God kills people with AIDS his God gives him more than he ever deserved even though he's the one making the mistake <laughs> who do you think got saved more people under my influence or people under his influence he had a whole Christian union at university. People would come and he'd play guitar and badly, foolishly, right? <laughs> Terribly. <laughs> but you know, people love Seamus because there's a grace on him because he just understands that God loves him. Now, I don't see the reason why God loves him. <laughs> As the older brother, I'm, I'm hard and I think he hasn't earned it. And he hasn't deserved it. He hasn't tried his best. Why hasn't he planned? Why doesn't he have his spreadsheets together? Why didn't he think about this beforehand? And yet, with all his weakness and foolishness, there's a grace on him. That's on very few people that I know. It's got nothing to do with his intelligence. 
It's got everything to do with his philosophy. He just knows that God loves him. And for whatever reason, that's enough. And so humbly as an older brother, I had to come to reckon, reconcile that my philosophy was lacking. That no matter how much strength I add to the equation, it doesn't improve God's grace. It dilutes it. It empties the cross of its power. Because you know what? If I get good clothes, it's because I worked hard and I planned and I diligently saved and I worked and I earned. If he gets clothes, it's all God's grace. Who gets the glory in my world? Me. Who gets glory in his world? God. Now, God doesn't love him more than he loves me. He's told me that himself. But I promise you, he, works, he walks in more love of God than I do. And I'm coming up and I'm catching up to the grace of God and all the rest. We've all got our own journeys. It's not, and it's not about comparison. Seamus and I don't compare ourselves like, like that. But I, I, I want to say your philosophy needs to, you need to change your philosophy about how good God is. And the implications that flow from that, that affect even your clothes going, being donated. This is not a theological seminary on a Sunday morning so you can sprout theological concepts to your neighbor and prove how clever you are. This is not what this is about. This is about practical implications flowing through you to affect every element of your life. You guys got time for one more hour? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. We've only got 16 scriptures left. Don't worry. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. If you chose a profile like Seamus's or, or chose a profile like mine, I'm not trying to be proud because it is proud, but you would choose my profile over his because it looked like I had it all together. But if you want the results, you've got to go with his just objectively. He's got better results. Why? Because God chose the weak things of this world to shame the wise. And I'm catching up to being weak. God chose the lowly things and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are. My behavior and mindset was nullified by something that looked like it wasn't anything, but that was much more powerful than what I walked in. So he nullified how he lived. He wasn't even trying to convert me or love me or any, any of that nonsense. He just lived under the grace of God, and that nullified my despising him. Because he just lived in grace. And no matter how much I accused him and attacked him and undermined him and tried to prove him wrong, he just lived in the same grace. It didn't matter what I said. Is that right, Shay? I'm not making this up. I'm sure he knew it at the time too. That's why he would smirk at me when I was having goes at him. Okay. Just go back to the previous verse for a second. Um, and and uh, he chose the lowly things, the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him, it is because of him you are in Christ Jesus. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. Let me say that again. It's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. If it's fully because of Jesus that you're in Christ Jesus, how much did you add to the equation? 50%? No, it's because of him that you're in Christ Jesus. 99%? No, no, no. It's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. Let me ask you a follow-up question. If it's fully because of him that you're in Christ Jesus, who keeps you in Christ Jesus? Once you come into Christ Jesus, whose responsibility is it to keep you in Christ Jesus? It doesn't change. It's always his responsibility. You come into him. You stay in him by him. It's all about him. We sing the songs. It's all about him. But then we do, or we think that we can do things. Think you can add a little bit of strength to what Jesus does? You cannot. It is because of Him that you're in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is, watch this wisdom. Watch this wisdom. He has become for us the wisdom from God. That is, our righteousness. He is our right standing. We have become the righteousness of God. In Christ Jesus. We've become righteous because he is righteous and now we're in him. So Jesus is our righteousness. Let me ask you this. I know the cheap answer and I know City Church Christians will answer quickly. But I want you to think about it for a couple seconds. If Jesus makes you righteous because it's in him, it's because of him that we're in Christ Jesus. If Jesus makes you righteous, can you make yourself 
unrighteous. Could I sin enough to become unrighteous in Christ Jesus? Is there something that I could do? Is there a line I could cross that would take me out of the righteousness of God? Let's, let's escalate this. If I lied to my boss that I was on time, but actually I was five minutes late, would I become unrighteous? Yes or no? No. So I'm still righteous, even though I just told a little lie. What happens if I stole $1,000 from the cash register at work? Am I unrighteous? No? I heard a no. What happens if on my way to work, I stabbed a little old lady and killed her? And I premeditated it. I actually planned it for six weeks in advance that I stabbed her on the way. Have I become unrighteous? Maybe. <laughs> what happens if next week I have an abortion? Am I unrighteous? Well, I become transgender and then I have an abortion. Have I become unrighteous? See, this is the issue. Christians go, yes, we believe by faith. Yes, God saves us. Yes, yes, yes. But if you sin too much, you're going to not be righteous before God. You will lose your salvation. Okay, let's just follow that line of thinking. Are you saying that you became righteous because of something you did? No, 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 no. It's all about the cross, all about the cross. But... I've got to keep my salvation. Oh, so Jesus won your salvation, but you've got to keep it. Um, well, no, 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 Jesus, no, no, he saved us, he saved us. But you know, if you're so bad, you know, how can you have an abortion and still be saved? But I never got saved because I didn't have an abortion. Otherwise, all men automatically would all be saved. Oh, no, no, you're being facetious. No, no, it's, you're being difficult, Sean. Think about it. If I am still righteous because I tell a five-minute lie about my, how late I am, and I'm fine with stealing $1,000, why all of a sudden does it change if I have an abortion, or I'm gay, or don't tithe, or don't go to church for 10 years? Oh, no, well, there's different levels of sin. There's different levels of sin. The Bible says there's... Yeah, but Galatians 3... James 2, Romans 2, all talks about if you break one little element, you break the whole thing. It proves that you're a lawbreaker. And if you have to try and rebuild the law, Romans 2, it proves you're a lawbreaker. Yeah, 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 but, but those are little things. God will understand those things. Oh, really? Have you just diluted the holiness of who God is? So you're allowing a little bit of sin into heaven in your philosophy? Yeah, no, 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 God will understand, God will understand, God will understand. So you're saying God's not just, not perfectly just. You're saying I could do a little favor for Bonnie. Bonnie just, just told me a little lie, so I'll let her in. But my aunt, she did something very bad, I won't let her in. Well, she would say that's not just. Because she still lied. Think about this. Philosophically, think about this. God is perfect. He is holy. He is righteous. If you break the smallest thing, you're guilty of breaking them all. You cannot choose a line about your, around your weaknesses. Just draw a line and say, these things are fine, but that thing is not fine. You can't do that. God is just. That means he's perfect. The smallest breakage means you break it all. You're just as guilty of adultery that if you stole $5. Because the same commandments are written on the same tablets of stone. If you break one, you break them all. Thank you, Moses, for that imagery. So then the question becomes, well, if I'm a lawbreaker, if I'm guilty of breaking every single commandment, including abortion, including trance, including gay, including not tithing, including a lying, including uh, adultery, Anger, covets, anything, not honoring my father and mother. If I've, well, I've broken every single one then. Now what do I do? Ah, 
The law's done its job. It's perfect. Now you've come to a place where you cannot rely on yourself. You need to let go of your strength because I may be really, really, really good with not lying, but I may really, really bad with adultery. Sean, have you committed adultery? No, I've never committed adultery, but I've looked at a woman with lust. You've looked at a woman with lust? Yeah, and if I've done that, I've lied, I've stolen, I've dishonored. Can you see all the things that I've done? Even if I made one mistake, I broke all of them. Now, if I'm in a boat with my neighbor and I'm going, you adulterer, you looked at a woman with lust, how dare you? And at the same time, I lied to my boss. The more I try and sink him by smashing up the boat that he's trying to rely on, the more I'm sinking myself because we're all in the same boat. All of you, humanity is in the same boat. That's why Jesus said, don't judge. He wasn't saying, ju don't judge so you can be a nice Christian and they'll accept you at their parties and then you can preach a little bit in the corner. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, don't judge because you're all in the same boat, humans. You need a savior. Just because you think you're better than someone else, you think you're better than someone else, doesn't mean your boat ain't sinking. It's all sinking. When you come into the grace of God and your philosophy adapts to that, you don't judge as much as you used to. You still judge. I judge all the time, mostly myself, but also others. But you judge others because you think that you're better than others and that God somehow picked you because you're more precious. No, God never picked you because you're precious. He picked you because he loved you. He loved you. So he saved you and he keeps the salvation for you. That's what being in Christ is. Let me give you a little analogy. Most people think that salvation is driving a car. And as you're driving the car on the road of salvation, if you get a little, a little distracted and you scratch your eye and you take your eye off the road just enough, you may just lose your salvation. And so you may just swerve the car off the road. Now, the first scratch is fine. You know, you can do a little bit bad. God understands. God loves you, right? Have you all heard this before? And so you scratch your eye a little bit, and, but you catch yourself in time and you stop and you make a vow that you'll never sin again. And you repent and you ask for forgiveness. You confess your sins and now you feel the closeness of the Holy Spirit again. And so you get back on the road of salvation. But it's only a matter of time until you scratch your eye again. And this time you go, oh, that feels so good. I'm just going to do it again. And now you crash your car on the side of the road because your salvation in your mind was dependent on you. If you do enough, Bad things, eventually you're going to lose your salvation. If you keep Hebrews 10, if you keep on deliberately sinning, you will lose your salvation. Trampling the blood of God underfoot. So no one can tell you, obviously, where the line is of what that sin is and how much you can commit it. And it's always ambiguous. It's always like, well, if you really repented, well, measure repentance. Measure really what that is. Oh, no, you, well, well, oh, God knows, God knows, God knows. And it's always a separation from philosophy because it's meant to be ambiguous because it keeps you on the tightrope of trying your best to look good in front of other people. Salvation is not earned by anything you do. Therefore, it cannot be lo lost by anything you do. Your righteousness is not your own. It's Christ's righteousness. So I can have a bad attitude. I can take my hands off the steering wheel. I can sin. I can uh, punch other people. I can just lose concentration and fall asleep at the wheel. And I lose my salvation under their own old philosophy. But here's a better picture, a much better picture. Imagine you get into the car in Christ. And you get into a car that you're not driving, but Jesus is driving. And now you're sitting in the passenger seat. His hands are on the wheel. It was his car of salvation that you invited you into. So now you're in Christ. Who's driving the car? Christ. Now you get in the car and you sit there and you're going, wow, I feel so good. I feel so close to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, my friend, my high priest, my big brother. God, hey, I'm sitting with you. And then you go and you scratch your eye and you take your eyes off the road for a second. And you catch yourself and you look back up on the road and the, road, and the car is perfectly on the road. It never veered off for one second. And you go, well, that's because I was really repentant. I was really, you know, I was really trying. My, it was just a moment, so God will forgive me of that. That's why the car stayed on the road. And so you carry on, and you're talking to Jesus, and he offends you a little bit because he's talking about the cross, and it, you don't like your sensibilities being ruffled. And so you get a bad attitude, and you cross your arms. And as you cross your arms, you take your eye off the road because you're angry with Jesus, and then you catch yourself, and you look back, and 
the cars perfectly on the road because Jesus still has his hand on the wheel. I'm sure there's a country song about Jesus take the wheel or something. <laughs> Jesus has always got the wheel. He doesn't have to take it. It's just a matter, a matter of whether you submit to that. No matter the sin that you commit, when Jesus is driving the car of salvation, you will never be off the road. You will never lose your salvation. There is no sin so great that you could commit that could make that car crash. Because the salvation that you received by faith was never earned by your behavior. Everything in your behavior was counter salvation. And yet you receive salvation as a free gift. And so because it was given to you as a free gift, you can't lose it by anything that you do. Imagine I'm generous and I give you a Netflix membership and you can log in with my details and I pay for it on my credit card every single month. Then you go out and you gamble and you lose all your money and you do something stupid. You spend it on prostitutes and blackjack. When you come back home and you log onto your computer, you still have a Netflix membership because you're not the one paying for it. I am. Now, I'm not saying go out and spend your money on hookers and blackjack. But what I am saying is what Jesus said, which is the foolishness of the cross. Shame the wise because there's nothing you could contribute to salvation. So there's nothing you can do to lose your salvation. You are eternally secure because Jesus is eternally secure. If salvation was dependent on you, you could lose it. But there's nothing in the gospel that talks about what you can do. Only thing you can do is say, thank you, Jesus. You believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. That's it. Baptism, tithing, church attendance, not sinning, trying to be holy. Doesn't matter what you list down. Doesn't matter all those good things. Doesn't matter what you list. There's nothing you can do to take you out of being in Christ, take you out of him driving the car on your behalf. Somebody say amen. amen. I want to just solidify this because that sounds like my idea. I promise you it's not my idea. It is the central tenant of Christianity. It is, the, it is what makes Christianity different from every other solution or, or religion. Not solution. They're not solutions. And what makes Christianity different from Judaism? Judaism says, earn and deserve. Try your best. Obey the commandments. Light your candles on a Friday night so that you don't have to light a fire because that's work. So you, you're doing a work by not working. Can you see how twisted that is? It was meant to collect all humanity in one boat and then go, this boat ain't making it. I need a relationship with Jesus because he can make it. Let's, let's finish 1 Corinthians 1 and then we're going to read two more scriptures. Just go back one slide. Let's read that again. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. If you could drive really well and keep your hands on the wheel and have enough coffee to keep the concentration, you could boast at the end of the road of salvation. You could say, I did it. And when Christian number two can't do it, you go, you didn't try hard enough. You didn't love God hard enough. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. You see, you broke the first commandment. I could do it. You stand before the Lord and say, I can do it, Lord. He says, there's only one who can stand before me. Depart before me, for I did not know you. No one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness. That is our relationship. There's a little caveat and deviation that some Christians say, listen, you're still righteous before God, but you've broken relationship. You've lost your relationship when you sin. That's why you feel guilty. Bull, nonsense, a lie from the devil. You, righteousness is relationship. It is right standing. If I lose righteousness, I lose relationship. If I lose relationship, I lose righteousness. And if Jesus is our righteousness, when you say you break relationship, you're breaking Jesus. That is deception from the devil. It is impossible. The wisdom from God has become our righteousness. He has become 
our holiness. Oh, we've got to be holy. You've got to be holy. You really think you could become holy? You think you could become holy? What is holiness? Well, holiness is not sinning. How deceived are you that you think you could not sin? Even if you couldn't sin from this point on, you were born into sin. You think that's holiness? Have you not seen what God did when he came to the cross? Do you think you could be that holy? You don't understand what holiness is if you think you could get holy. That's disgusting deception. The holiness movement has some kernel of, kernel of truth in it, but it denies God placing us in him and puts the emphasis on what we can do. It is a devilish lie. And it's just as bad all the other lies that we tell ourselves about when we try and add to the cross. It's just as bad. Don't think they're any worse than us. They're just as holy as, uh, than us in Christ. But don't you fall for the trap to think that you could be like God, Adam and Eve. You can't be like him because he created you to be like him. So you can't do anything else to add to what he's already done. Otherwise, you're emptying the cross of its power. So he's become our right standing. He's become our relationship. He's become our righteousness. He is our holiness and he is our redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. When we boast about how great things are in our lives, we're boasting about what God has done for us, not what we've done. Okay, two scriptures left. Romans 3. For I'm... Now that we know, we know what the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. The purpose of the law was to show you how unholy you were and how every attempt you made to become holy was a failure. Why does it silence you? It doesn't come and physically sew your mouth up. It comes to show you, just like Jesus showed those Pharisees and teachers of the law who caught the woman caught in adultery. Who caught the woman caught in adultery? <laughs> who exposed the woman caught in adultery. He said, which of you has not sinned? You cast the first stone. And those who are wisest, the oldest, left first. That's what the law does. Jesus wasn't showing grace to them. He was showing the law to them. And so they all, oh, when truth spoke, they had to change their philosophy and go, I've got to shift. I am not righteous by my own standard, by the standards of the law. And they walked away. And then Jesus said, woman, where are your accusers? Then neither do I accuse you. He was never going to accuse her. He was defending her. But he had to show them that they were just as guilty the next time you want to point to someone else and say how do they call themselves a christian they just did this they just did that what you're going to get if jesus was in the room you're going to get the law you're going to get an expose on how loud you're allowed to be which is because all of us have broken something and if you've broken something you've broken everything so everyone's under the law so every mouth may, may be silenced there's no boasting when you're in front of the law. No boasting whatsoever. So that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held, held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. No one is righteous. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin or of our sin. But now, uh, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith. faith. Not given through works. Not given through you trying to earn and deserve your salvation. It's given through faith. Not faith as you trying to position yourself and earn and deserve. And if I do enough, then God. That's not faith. That's works. It's faith that just says, oh God, you come to my house. That's faith. Not you going to God's house. He came to your house. The righteousness is given through faith. Watch that word given. It is given. Not earned. Given through faith in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus uh, to all who believe. There is no difference between Jews and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if you've sinned and fallen short, 
Short is short. I don't care how tall you think you are. You have fallen short. You cannot reach salvation. There's nothing you can do to earn and deserve it. But the good news is, whilst you've fallen short, there was one who didn't fall short. And he freely justified us, or just us, justified us freely by his grace. So the law is an advertisement that you could earn and deserve. And then it shows you that you can't. But grace in this is an advertisement for what he did and gives to you freely. Can you see that? Justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Imagine you had to receive redemption by cutting yourself and spilling your own blood. Imagine it didn't have to be received by faith in there. And we could interpret that however we chose. And now we have to attend church five times a week. Or whatever I say, because I want to look good. I want to look like my attendance is bigger in my church. So I want to put it on Facebook and advertise how successful I am. So I just tell you, you need to get to church. Oh, you don't get the redemption of Jesus. I'm so glad priests and pastors do not have a monopoly on the word of God. Because they did for 1,500 years. The Catholic Church, only priests were allowed to read the Bible. Do you know that? I was accused in Dublin. I'm standing on the very streets they're rioting in these days. I was standing with a big sign, and someone came up to me and said, How can you interpret John 3, 7? Do not, be, do not marvel that you should believe. And I said to him, Sorry, it's, just, it's like plain English. This is really simple. He said, how dare you read the Bible? Are you a priest? And I said to him, yes, I am a priest. Said, no, you're not a priest. Can you speak Latin? And I said, I'm a priest because it's a priesthood of all believers. But he wanted me to have a dog collar. And I'm not, I haven't gone to cemetery. I haven't gone and learned all the Greek and Latin. I don't sing the special hymns. And so, it's, so he said, by his account, I'm not a priest. And so I wasn't allowed to interpret the Bible. And so he could dismiss me quickly because only his Catholic father, impotent, could interpret the bible thank god that you have access to the word of god and thank god that the access to the word of god isn't dependent on your education i wonder how many of us would make it if it was very few of us one corinthians one says very few but because he chose the foolish things to shame the wise that guy went away went away bitter and angry and probably couldn't sleep that night and i went away thanking god and had something to preach 15 years on. No. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. Uh, <laughs> the shedding of his blood. To be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. So to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith. So he didn't let you off. Your parking ticket. You had to pay your parking ticket and it was fully paid. But he paid it on your behalf. When you sin, whatever sin you've committed, Jesus doesn't go, oh, I'm, I, you know, you're my favorite. That's not how grace works. Grace doesn't go, I'm letting you off. That's what mercy is. He didn't save us by mercy. He was merciful, but he didn't save us by mercy. He saved us by grace. Grace is the price is fully paid so he can be completely just but not only is he just he also justified Amen. he demonstrated that he was just and the one who justifies those who have faith in jesus where then is boasting it is excluded because of what law the law that requires works the thing that you can do and add to the equation no because of the law that requires faith let's look at the law now for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law for it is written the just will live by faith that's the Lord's referring to okay last run of scriptures you all okay for another couple minutes Romans 4 says now to the one who works wages not credited as a gift but as an obligation however to the one who does not work but trust God however to the one who does not work this is a foolish statement <laughs> to the one who does not work. 
What's the point of Christianity if I don't get a new job, a new ladder to climb? It's a whole other system. To the one who does not work, but trust God, who justifies the ungodly, the wicked, the dirty, the sinner. But trust God who justifies the ungodly. Can you see that when I give, if I've got the wrong philosophy, I think my giving earns me some bit of favor. You know, when I pray really hard and I get a miracle, that's because I prayed. Therefore, I can boast about it. That's work. Now, what's the difference between someone praying and getting a miracle and someone praying uh, and getting a miracle. A huge difference. Well, Sean, it's the same thing. No, if I'm praying and I'm trying to get a miracle because I'm praying and I'm so wonderful and God better hear my prayers because he owes me because I prayed, that's devilish, man. But when I just add a humility and say, God, I know you're good and you've commanded me to pray, so I'm going to pray, but I know that I have no power. I know all the powers in the cross. Then I pray. One is attempting to earn and it may work for a little time because God is so merciful. But this will work every single time because he's gracious. Amen. It looks the same on the surface. This, this, this is why testimonies are such a wonderful thing, but such a terrible thing at the same time. Because a testimony can say, I did X, Y, and Z, and then this beautiful thing happened. So your formulaic brain goes, okay, I'm going to be strong like them. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. But God didn't ever honor X, Y, and Z. That's not why. It's not because you did something that he produced a result. It's because he's good. Now the one who works, wages not credit as a gift, but as an obligation however, to the one who does not work, but trust God who justifies the ungodly. Their faith is credited as righteousness. Last scripture. It was not through the law and your ability to perform and your strength and your wisdom. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that it would be the heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. Do you know how crazy it is to believe that you're righteous? Do you know how foolish that is? Here I am, a druggie, an adulterer, a murderer, a rapist, an abortionist, and I've done nothing to counter that except believe. How foolish is that? Well, 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 have you been to church for a decade? No. Did you get baptized? No. Did you give any tithes? No. Did you even say sorry and ask for forgiveness from all your victims? No. Well, what did you do? I, I didn't do anything. I just believed. And I became the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Do you know how foolish that is? That should be mocked in the streets. And the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. How can you boast if you do all of this? Yeah, I can't boast. I only boast in the Lord. It was not through the law that the promise to be heir of the world would, become, would come, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For of those who depend, everyone say depend. Depend. This is what it comes down to. What are you depending on? For those who depend on the law are heirs. Faith means nothing. And the promise is worthless. Why is the promise worthless? Because you will never be able to keep the law enough to inherit the promise. To the one who works, his wages are not given as a gift, but an obligation. And you will get what you deserve if you rely on the law, which is death. Faith means nothing and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath. The law doesn't bring wrath because God's angry. The law brings wrath because you break it. And the penalty of sin is death. Amen. God is just. Don't think he's going to let you get away with it and turn a blind eye. Or you can lie three times before God gets angry. No, God's instantly angry under the law because there's a wrath that comes with that penalty. You know, God's not angry with you. God loves you. But in Christ Jesus, you get the benefits Amen. of that. Faith means nothing in promise world because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no breaking of the law. That sounds so obvious. But philosophically, we go, grace, grace, grace. But if I break the law a few many times, I might lose my salvation. Well, here, the Bible is saying, where there is no law, there is no breaking of the law. This is controversial. You know, most Christians don't believe this. Do you know that? You know that City Church is probably one of five churches in Hong Kong, and I'm being generous, that believe that the law is no longer applicable. And that if you sin, God's not angry with you. 
Do you know most places in Hong Kong would say that it's heresy? Because under that philosophy, they lose the control of people. Yeah. Now, how, what's going to stop you sinning if you don't have a law telling you not to sin? And the culture is in Hong Kong, just to ignore Christianity for a second, the culture in Hong Kong is a shame-based culture, that you need to get a good education, because if you don't, I'm going to shame you. You know that in my country where I was born, if my parents said, Sean, we're not going to love you if you don't get a university education, I'd go, yeah, fine. Our culture is fairly rebellious. I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just giving you the facts. A lot of people in that part of the world are very, have very successful lives without education. It's just not a thing. You can't shame the majority of people in that way. In Hong Kong, it is a shame-based culture. Not a lot of amens, but that's true. Chinese people, lot at me. How many of you made decisions as kids because your parents wanted you to make the decision even though you didn't want to? It's a shame-based culture. Why do you think churches would be any different? Well, uh, theology, theology. Theology is filtered through philosophy. That's why you need to be exposed to good godly preaching with revelation because it changes your philosophy. I understand that about a year ago we were preaching on the fatherhood of God and how God loves you as a son. And Kayla said to me, you know, Sean, when you talk about God loving you, Chinese people hear, yeah, God loves you, but you've got to do X, Y, and Z. So they're nodding, but they don't understand what you're talking about. And I realized there's some cultures in the world that when you talk about a father's love, I know what my father's, I know my father laid down his life. He worked three jobs at one point. I know what his love for me was. I know he spent time with us. And he loved us independent of our performance at school. I never thought if I didn't get an A in maths that my dad would be angry with me. Never once. It never crossed my mind. I just knew that he loved me. What a joy that is. What a privilege that is. But you know, Chinese people don't grow up with that. They know if they don't get perfect grades, they're rejected. And so philosophy limits the good nature of God through filtering through like, I've got to earn and deserve. I've got to earn and deserve. So we're laboring this. I'm sorry, Westerners, sometimes if you get bored by grace preaching, but you've got to understand that Chinese people and us Westerners too, all of us, we need to hear theology so it can change our philosophical frames. God loves you independent of your A grade, B grade, C grade, or no grade. He loves you because he chose to love you. God doesn't need you. You know, your parents may need you because they know they're going to get old and they need money in their old age. And so they have six kids. So this is what happens in Africa. <laughs> they have six kids because one of them's going to make it and become a doctor or a lawyer <laughs> so that they can pay for them. God never adopted you as his sons because he needed you. For God so needed the world that he gave his one and only son. No, he never needed the world. He never needed the world. But God so loved the world. So as you let that soak into your psyche and you let your philosophical frame be challenged and offended and broken and rebuilt, you have a bigger scope of God's goodness. There's nothing you can do to earn God's love. And therefore, there's nothing you can do that will break God's love. Because God loved you independent of you and your performance. He just loves you. Because God is love. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes not by performance, not by works, not by what you do or don't do. The promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. There's only one place. There's a guarantee. It's in grace. The grace guarantee says you access by faith and faith alone. Yeah, but, 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 but. I hope your butts are disappearing. I hope you're getting a nice diet today. No more butts. The grace guarantee says it's got nothing to do with you. Not only to those who have the, the law, but those who have the faith of Abraham. That's the Jews and Gentiles. He is the father of us all. As, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is, he is our father in the sight of God. This is Abraham. Because Abraham, Genesis 15, 6, he believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. He is the father of us all in the sight of God. In whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though 
they were. Just lift your hands and say, Father, we thank you. We thank you that you accept us because you accepted your son. And if we're in Christ, then we're in you. Not by our performance, not by our works, not by what we do or don't do, but by the holiness of the precious blood of Jesus. Jesus, we thank you that you became our holiness, our righteousness, and our redemption. Thank you that you were so good to us. When we deserved death, you gave us life. When we deserved punishment, you gave us peace. When we deserved the law, you gave us grace. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, I pray that every area of my life that I'm conscious of, where my philosophy has limited you, where my, the traditions of my parents, of my fathers, have nullified the word of God, I, I repent to that and I say, Lord, I'm sorry. More so than I'm sorry for sin and misbehavior, I'm sorry for where I have limited your good nature through my life. Lord, I pray by revelation that you reveal to me what the Son did on that cross, the foolishness of the cross in my life. I thank you that the power of God is in that cross, in that weakness. I thank you that the wisdom of God is in that cross. And I just submit myself afresh and again and consciously to your goodness, to your love, to your grace. By faith, I just say, Lord, give me another breath of your goodness, another breath of your grace. Thank you. Just physically now, just take a breath. Just take a moment. Just, just breathe in his life. Jesus, where I've come under pressure and stress to try and have it all together, to know all the things, to do all the right things, I just let that go now. I just, you know, you can't receive a gift if your hands are clenched with responsibility. You must let that go Amen. so you can receive. I just pray that each, each and every single one of us would get better at letting go so we can receive. Yeah, yeah. We can receive. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you come alongside us to counsel us, to convict us of our righteousness, not of our wrongs. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would enlarge our vision of how good the Father is. Thank you. And every single one of us just say, thank you, Jesus, for what you did. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Wow, he is good, hey? He's really, really good. You know, you'll never get bored in all eternity, not in this lifetime and not in eternity, will you ever get bored But considering what he did on that cross. It is a, wow. it's the most dramatic moment in history. It's the most loving moment. It's the most gruesome moment in history. Wow. So just thank him. Thank you. Bless you, City Church. We love you. And we'll see you next week. Bless you. Amen.